starts in exactly the same way. So today is a continuation of last week. And in this, in this little brochure, it says this. It says, you know, it talks about Colossians 2, um, that all of Judaism is tabniot, or pictures cast by, shadows cast by Yeshua, or pictures. And then it says there are several passages in the Bible that tell us this. <laughs> On the heels of you listening to the setup things, the meat spoke, which I'm setting up for you today, Deuteronomy 11, 13, and then the blessing, if you listen to the meat spoke of the Lord your God, which I'm setting up for you today, and the curse, if you don't listen to the meat spoke. Not if you don't listen to the commandments. If you don't listen to the setup things of the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 11, 27 through 28, Listening to the very acts of Judaism speak makes very complicated things simple. Simple enough for children to look at and get understanding. And that's the nut. That's it. That's the bottom line. For 2,000 years, well, I'm going to say 1,700 years, for 1,700 years, people, Jews and Gentiles, have been trying to obey God. And it simply doesn't work. It's a failed operation. It's a failed experiment. Nobody was able to do it. And yet, in the church, they keep teaching it over and yeah. over and over and over as if it's going to change. And it's on the table on the outside in the ante room. Einstein said, they asked Einstein what's the definition of insanity. And he said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It ain't going to be different. There's going to be no different result from the church saying we must obey the Lord. Or from Jews saying we must obey the commandments. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. That's why there's no restoration. That's why God has not restored His body. He hasn't restored His body because people are trying to obey Him. And it does not work. You know what I'm saying. You've tried to obey God. And how long did it last? Two minutes. Seven minutes or eight? <laughs> Two. Two. Okay. It doesn't work. You can't do it. So stop trying. Knock it off. It doesn't work. When I'm in school teaching, my middle school art students, they have a model set up. You know, a live model, and everybody in the class has to pose. You just go, you know, everybody who, who gets the student expectations and they master it. I give them a 90 on their drawing, of them drawing the model, and then they're in the model pool, then they model. So everybody eventually models because everybody has mastered the material. Well, the ones who don't master the material keep trying to draw the model. These are kids. They don't know how to draw people. And they've got this voice in their head, I tell them. You've got a voice in your head that says, you can't draw people. And they go, Yes, sir. Well, it's telling the truth. It's mean, but it's telling the truth. They can't draw people. So I tell them this. Draw one shape at a time. Just pick one shape. You go like this. You put that model in that box. You draw one shape. One shape. One shape at a time. And magically, Guess what appears on the paper? No. But every single time without fail that a student tries to draw the model, it doesn't work. Because they don't know how. And I look at this exactly as the same as the body and the sun. Precisely the same. People who are believers keep trying to obey God. And we can't. We can't do it. But we can listen to one law at a time. Yes. We can listen to it. We can listen to one law, like tzitzit, kippah, shabbat, kiddush. We can listen to one at a time. And it gives us understanding. And magically, we end up being holy. Yes. Which means set apart. Like magic works the same exact way. So I'm pretty excited about this tiny little thing because it's tiny. And it sums up what pictures is very, very simply. It sums up what we're doing very, very simply. 
and I've never been able to do it before in 30, 32 years. So today's Torah portion continues from last week's Torah portion, and it starts the same way. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, and you'll see it starts almost precisely the same way. Verse 26. See, look, 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 look. So what does that mean God wants people to do? Open their eyes. I'm going to do it again. When I'm teaching at school, and I tell them, don't try to draw the model. It says on the student expectations, just look at the shapes. Just look at the shapes. I say, how many shapes? One at a time. And the same thing here. God says, open your eyes and look. And you're going to get something. You're going to learn something. So that's the name of the Torah portion is Re'e, which means see, look. Re'e. Say Re'e. 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 Means look or see. Now I've written it here for you the way it is in, uh, what's, the Bible that everybody uses that we don't like. NIV. NIV. NIV is a translation like any other translation, but there's a problem with it. They've gutted it of the Jewish understandings of a lot of words. Not all of it, obviously, but a lot of it. Um, but this is from the NIV, and look how it reads. Oh, there it is right there. All I have to do is look. Look, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord. And a curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord. Now, don't lie to me and tell me that's not in your head. You've been thinking that. You've heard that your whole life. We all have. It's all stuck in here like glue. So the problem is how do we get rid of it? It's really, really tough. These kids who are trying to draw a model that they don't know how to draw, they've got in their head this voice that says, you can't draw people, which is like a command. And they go, yes, sir, I can't. And then they mess it up. And we're doing the same thing. If you try to obey some command, you're doing the same thing that these kids do, and you're making the same mistake that has been made for 1,700 years. Over and over, each generation. Has it worked? Is the body of Messiah one? Has Judaism been restored to the body and everybody knows God and everybody speaking the same language, doing the same thing at the same time? No. Not even close. Not even close. Here's why. Disobey. Obey. Command. Commands. This was translated by normal, mature, studied adults. And yet, it is 180 degrees wrong. This was translated by theologians who are smart, who went to school. But it's wrong. Because it has been gutted of what Judaism says. What Judaism says is this. Look, it's see. I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you listen. If you listen to the meat, to the set up things. The meat spoke. Sabah, the word commandment, what they translate commandment, is from the word sabah, which means to set up or to establish. That's all it means. It doesn't carry the force of a command. It simply means something that's established or set up. That's all. You're supposed to listen to the meat spoke, to the set up things of the Lord your God. And a curse if you do not listen to the set up things. Not if you don't obey a command. Do you understand the difference? Yes or no? Yeah? Yes. It's starting to congeal? Because this is 180 degrees opposite from what you've been taught. And I know it is. So I know it's weird. I get it. But that's what the Hebrew says. Listen to the mitzvah. 
Well, how do you listen to the to Shabbat? The new moon is coming on Wednesday, Tuesday and Wednesday. How many of you have done the new moon? Done the Jewish festival of the new moon? Well, I'll probably not do it right. But Wait, have you done it? Try it. <laughs> yeah. Four. Okay. Why don't people in church do the new moon? It's a commandment. Because it's Jewish. Right. <laughs> exactly right. Because it's Jewish. But I thought we were supposed to listen. I thought we were supposed to obey the commands of the Lord. Well, we, either we are or we're not. You can't pick and choose. If something's in the Bible and God says, you shall keep the new moon, then should you keep the new moon? Or it's not a command. Well, it's not. It is a festival that God created that teaches us. You look, you listen to it, and you learn. But you've got to do it to listen to it. So on Tuesday and Wednesday, when Rosh Hashanah comes, I challenge you to find a prayer book, any prayer book, you can go online, you can do anything you want, and just type in Rosh Hashanah, new moon. How do you do it? What are the prayers? And try it. And I'll bet you anything, if you can struggle through doing it, I bet it will show you something. I bet it will teach you something about God. It has one of the greatest doctrines in the entire Word of God in the Rosh Chodesh. You know what it is? Born again. Right. The phrase born again comes from Rosh Chodesh. And yet nobody does Rosh Chodesh in the body of Messiah. And that's where born again comes from. So we got a problem. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to listen to it. But you can't listen to it unless you do it. And that's what God is saying. Look, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you listen to Jewish stuff, I'll just call it. If you listen to the Jewish stuff of the Lord your God. And a curse if you don't listen to the Jewish stuff. A curse if you don't listen to the Jewish stuff. A curse if you don't listen to the Jewish stuff. A curse if you don't listen to the Jewish stuff. Why do you think churches are so big? Because God is blessing them? No. Because, as some sarcastic kid wrote in my ROTC class on the table in pen, deeply engraved, eat poop. And it didn't say poop. A hundred billion flies can't be wrong. That's why churches are so big. Because it's just what everybody does. It's not God blessing. The blessing is if you listen to this Jewish stuff. That's the blessing. That's when God blesses you. The blessing is you knowing God. How much God do you know? How much of God do you really know? Are you do you know when he's happy? Do you know when he's sad? Do you know when he's angry? Do you know when he wants to dance? Do you know when he wants to pull a sword out of his sheath and start slicing? Do you know how he feels when he feels it? And it does not come through prayer. i got news for you. I've met, at this point in my old age, hundreds of thousands of believers who have no clue about what the times of God are and so they don't know what God is doing or thinking or saying or feeling. They get little tiny bits of information, like an antenna, like picking up an AM radio station that's tinny and hard, to, and it drops in and drops out, it comes and goes, it comes and goes, and they can hear it, then they can't hear it, it's hard to hear. That's what prayer is in the church. That's what it is. However, they are getting signals from the Holy Spirit, but it's not clear it's not precise, and it's not often. If you do this, if you listen to the mitzvot, I'm going to say it again, if you listen to the Jewish stuff, it's a, you'll get the blessing. And the blessing ain't money. 
The blessing is knowing God. I mean, I think that's why we're here. Because we want to know God. Well, listen to the Jewish stuff. If you don't know something about God, you'll find it in Jewish stuff. That's where you'll find it. And if you start doing the cycle of Judaism, and I mean really doing it, I don't mean here and there and picking and choosing and, oh, I'm busy this week, I can, yeah, whatever. Do it. Like, do it consistently. And I guarantee you, the more you do it, the more you're going to understand God. And maybe, this is a big maybe, you might, and I'm saying this because of me, this might say maybe, you might stop being a jerk. Yeah. It's a big maybe. It'll change you, but from my own personal experience, I'll tell you this, I was doing Judaism, trying to listen to it, and, and listening to it, sometimes really well, but I was still a jerk. I was a horrible jerk. And over time, it changed me. It's like circumcising. When, when that foreskin is cut off the penis, it's in a circular motion. It's in a circular motion, like the Jewish festivals. It's a cycle. We call it a cycle. A seder, an order, a cycle, a chag, a circle. That's what the festivals are all called. The cycle is called that. Sorry, the year, the biblical year is called that. And if you go around that year, over and over, eventually it circumcises you. And that's what happened to me. It just took a long time because I'm so stubborn. And I'm just talking from experience, it will change you. Hopefully, because you're a better person than I am, it won't take as long. But over time, it will change you. It'll change you a lot more effectively than obeying commands. I guarantee you that. And I say that from experience. Not from my experience. From other people me experiencing them. And I'm talking about believers. People who were born again for years and years. Who love God and love everybody. But they don't know thing one about God. They think they do, but they don't. I ask them a simple question that kindergartners in Judaism know. They don't know. They don't know what God feels and thinks about it. The very, very first time I preached, I was, I was a young jerk. God, was I a jerk. Just arrogant jerk. And we went to Marion, Louisiana. Way back in the woods. Up there, buried in the woods. My God, there was KKK up there. Probably neo-Nazis, but we knew there was KKK. It was scary up there, man. It was scary. And we're up there, and I'm talking to the pastor. By God. And... The pastor and I went for a long walk. And I think I'd only been doing and learning from Judaism maybe five years, four years, something like that. It's pretty new. We went for a long walk, and he was old and had been in this street for a long time. This was the very first time I ever went out to teach. And just from talking, he said this, Really? I realized I don't know God. And he quit the ministry. And he shut the church down. And he became, this is funny, he became a carpenter. <laughs> Isn't that funny? He followed his master and he became a carpenter. Ironic, but it's the truth. He said to me, to my face, Brother, I realize I don't know God. And I was a young jerk who'd only been doing Judaism for five years. He'd been in ministry years and years and years. And he shut the church down. So, I want you to understand that there's a whole lot going on. But it's like Hamlet. Uh, I think it's Horatio's father says to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, O Horatio. More things in heaven and earth that you can even dream of. That's how Judaism is. The depth of understanding of God is so amazing in Judaism, it's hard to even fathom what we don't know.
a blessing if you listen to the setup things. A curse if you don't. A curse if you don't. Now these, all these passages, Deuteronomy 7, 12, 11, 13, 11, 27, and 28, Deuteronomy 28, 13, Judges 2, 17, and Nehemiah 9, they all say the same thing. They all say, listen to the meat spoke. Don't obey a command. Listen to the meat spoke. Listen to it. That song that we say, Aznaim Karita, Aznaim Karita, you've opened my ears. This comes from Psalm 40, verse 6. Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. By the way, Christians love to quote this verse. They love to quote this verse. Why? Because it says, I don't want sacrifices. Right. Just like Isaiah chapter 1 where God says, your sacrifices and your meal offerings are an abomination to me. And then there's a couple other passages that go along with the same thing. He's not saying I don't want the sacrifices. He's the one who invented it in the first place. He's saying, <coughs> sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired, God, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. This is talking about Yeshua. The Word became flesh. Behold, it is written in the book of me, Yeshua says. So what he's saying is, in the midst of saying, you weren't asking for a sacrifice and meal offering. You were asking for me to open my ears. You were asking for me to open my ears. Look, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you listen to the meat spoke. And then David says in Psalm 40, you didn't, you weren't looking for the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. You were looking for what? For me to open my ears. As Naim Karita, you've opened my ears. Burnt offering and sin offering, you, you weren't requiring. If it was required, what would it be? If it was a requirement, what would it be? What would we call that? A law. A law. A or a commandment. A law. Right? It says here it's not a law or a commandment. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. He gave it to us. He gave it to the Jews. Said, do it. And then said, what? Listen, Listen to it. Listen to it. Don't listen to me saying, do it. Listen to it. He gave us the Torah, gave us each of the laws, said, do them forever, by the way. And then says, listen to them, and you'll receive a blessing. And that's exactly, basically what it's saying here. Sacrifice and meal offering, that's not what you were looking for. That wasn't your desire. My ear you have opened Burnt offering and sin offering wasn't the requirement. Then I said, behold, it's written of me. I come. It's written of me in, in the scroll, in the book. I come. Talking about the Messiah. Then look at verse 8. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your Torah is inside my heart. God didn't ask for burnt offerings and sin, and sin offerings. He didn't ask for that. He hates that. Then why do we put it in our heart? It makes no sense. It's illogical. It's illogical to say, this is saying God doesn't want Judaism. It's illogical. Your Torah, you put in my heart. So I do it, I listen to it, and I get it. And that's how it's supposed to work. Now Job 33, this, uh, Job 33, 36, and Isaiah 50, these, all these passages say basically the same thing. I want to read the one in, <clears throat> in Job. If I can find Job. Job 33. Verse 16. Well, verse 15. Verse 13. 
I'm going to start with 13. Listen to these words. Why? By, by the way, this is Elihu, who was a good guy. There's three bad guys in this story, the three friends of Job. But then this kid comes along named Elihu, who's not one of the three friends. And he's young. He's the youngest of all of them. And he says pretty good stuff. One of the things he says is, verse 13, Why do you complain against him that he doesn't give an account of what he's doing? You know, God will speak once or twice, yet no one notices it. God's talking, but ain't nobody listening. Verse 15, In a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men, while they slumber in their beds, then he, aznaim karita, then he opens the ear of men and seals their Torah, seals their instruction, seals their Torah. When is the Torah sealed? When he opens the ear. Well, how are you going to get your ear open? That's the trick. How do you get your ear open? That's in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, faith comes by hearing. And hearing, how? I said it last week. Hearing, how does it come? How does hearing come? Let's look at it. Romans chapter 10. I know what you're thinking. How do kids put up with you in middle school? This is how you teach in middle school. You're like a jackhammer. Romans 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing comes from the word. the word of the Lord, the Word of God, the Word of Messiah. Hearing comes from the Word of Messiah. If this is the Word of Messiah, this book, the stuff that's written in it, will give you the gift of hearing. You don't hear it naturally. We don't hear it just because we're people. Because we're going, oh Lord, I'm listening unto you, Lord. It doesn't work that way. This, what's written in it, will give you the gift of hearing. And then it opens up and you can hear. Now remember how the Torah portion started. What word did the Torah portion start with? What word did the Torah portion start with? C. A. C. C. He tells the Jews to open their eyes first, and when they open their eyes, they are able to. Whoop, I go down here. They will be able to listen. If they open their eyes, they will be able to listen. That is exactly what Romans 10:17 is saying. You don't hear by going, "Yes, Lord." You hear by opening your eyes. To the Jewish stuff. You do it, you look at it, what was that? Really? That's very interesting. That's amazing. What? You get information, you listen to it, but you got to get those eyes open first. And that's what Romans 10 17 is saying. It says, faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of Messiah. So you've got to get the gift of hearing first before you can hear what this stuff has to say. If you don't, it's a commandment and it will curse you. It will curse you. Judaism will curse you. That's why it's called the curse of the law in the New Testament. Because there were people who were doing it and doing it good, but they didn't listen to it. It wasn't a picture of Yeshua. It wasn't a shadow cast by Yeshua. That is the curse of the law. If you do something Jewish and somebody asks you, why do you do that? And you say, I just love Israel and I love the Jews. That's a curse. That has nothing to do with Scripture. Nothing. If somebody says to you, why do you do, why do you wear a kippah? And you can't say, because it's a picture of uh, whatever. It's the palm. It's the palm of God's hand. God's walking around with his hand on my head. If you can't do that, you're, don't do it. It's a curse. If you wear tzitzit and you can't teach from these fringes, and they don't talk to you about 
what they're saying about God and His name, it's a curse. It's the curse of the law. And it will profit you zero. Just like Christianity has done. Listen to the same commandments and the same obey week after week after week has profited nobody anything. Because it hasn't opened their ears. Now, having said that, and I say it in in the little uh, pamphlet that I wrote, which has disappeared very well. It says, so what makes Leptio different? It says, the body of Messiah is turning more and more to its, quote, Jewish roots. Because God is restoring all of his ways, Judaism, to his people as the day of the Lord approaches, Acts 3.21. Because we want to be an integral part of this move of God, toward restoration of the world, or tikkun olam, we do Judaism so we can see Yeshua. We want to be part of that. God's doing it. God is absolutely doing it. Turning his body toward the Jewish roots. But if you talk to most Christians, and they're turning to the Jewish roots, this is what they say. I love Israel. I love Israel. And that's why they're doing it. That's not the Jewish roots. The Jewish roots is the Jewish stuff. Now, yeah, it's a good move in the right direction. Nothing wrong with it. It's cool. But it's not Jewish roots. Jewish roots is Judaism. So it's moving in that, you know, like I said, it's a giant ship. And it's turning very, very, very slowly. But it is turning, and it is going to get there. And we want to be a part of that. Well, the key is this. Aznaim Karita, you've opened my ears. Not open my ears to hear a commandment. Open my ears to hear the Jewish stuff. Because that's what talks. I think I've said that now 12 times. I'm probably going to say 12 more. <laughs> now, now, we're, now I can teach. Now, <laughs> now, now I'm coming to the teaching. Here's the teaching. In the Torah portion, farther on in the Torah portion, Deuteronomy 15, let's go there. Deuteronomy 15 is still in the Torah portion for this week. And it says this, 15.12. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years. But in the seventh year, you shall set him free. And we know what that's a picture of. It's a picture of the day of the Lord. 6,000 years, mankind will serve. And then in the, from the year 6,000 to the year 7,000 is the day of the Lord. That's what this is a picture of. But there's more here. When you set him free, you shall not send him away empty handed. You shall furnish him liberally with stuff. Give him all kinds of stuff. Verse 15. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. <coughs> Verse 16. It shall come about if he says to you, you know, I don't want to go out from you. I want to stay in the house. I want to serve you in your house. I will not go out from you because he loves you. Because he loves you. And because he loves your house. Not because he needs the money. Not because he's your slave. Because he loves you. And he loves being in your house. Since he fares well with you. Then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your servant forever. When I was young, I, I don't know why, but I didn't think of you know, like just piercing the ear, like you know, regular piercing the ear. I kept thinking of like sticking an awl in the ear and, you know, how stupid, but that's what I thought. And I know you guys are smarter than me, so you're just thinking, you somehow get the ear against the door and pierce it. I don't know how. I don't have any pierced ears. But you get the ear against the door and you pierce it and the, the bond servant says, I'm going to serve you how long? Forever. That's not possible. I'm going to die in a few years. I can't serve you forever. But that's what it says. So obviously this is a picture, right? It's not real. I mean, obviously Jews did this. 
But it's not, it wasn't a law. This is how we do this law. It's a picture to teach us something more, something spiritual. Because the guy's supposed to say, I'm going to serve your house forever, which means in the kingdom, in the kingdom. So this is much, much bigger than just a little law about piercing the ear. It has nothing to do with that. Now in the parallel passage in Exodus, chapter 21, it's the very same, quote, law, the same Torah, the same mitzvah, <laughs> set up thing. It says in Exodus 21, by the way, this is the very first of the Mishpatim judgments. It says, uh, these are the ordinances, the Mishpatim, which you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, you shall serve me for six years. Seventh, he goes out free. Exactly the same thing. Parallel passage. And then in verse um, 5, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God, then he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost. Now, in Deuteronomy, it says bring him to the door and pierce his ear. Bring him to the door. But here in the parallel passage, we get a little bit more information. Bring him to the door or the mezuzah, the doorpost. So it can be either one. Aha, thank you very much, my little friend. This is a mezuzah. This is a mezuzah. Nowadays. And it has a scroll on the inside of this little box. This is empty. Once it goes on the door post, put the scroll in. And the scroll is the Shema and a couple of other passages about the blessing of Israel. This is nowadays. This is ancient. That's a mezuzah. That's a big old mezuzah. See that big giant stone pillar? That's a mezuzah. Wow. What does a mezuzah mean? Doorpost. Door Here's a doorpost. Here's a doorpost. The door was in between. So if the doorpost was made of wood, you could do the same thing. Here's the ear. Or it could be stone, I guess. It's kind of weird to stick your ear up against a stone. Uh, piercing, I guess. But look how big that that hole in there is. That's a foot. It's this big. And there were scrolls put in there. Big ones. That was the mezuzah. Now, because we're in America, uh, God, we shrunk that puppy down. And you should all put a mezuzah on your doorpost. There's prayers to say. There's amazing meanings in the, in the mezuzah about yeah. A book full. It's amazing. So, I started thinking, you put your ear against the mezuzah, and you pierce it, and you serve forever. What's in the mezuzah? What's in the mezuzah? The word is. The word is. The word is. The right. The devar The word of God. You stick your ear against it. To hear. To, to hear. It's the same picture. Put attention. Put attention, exactly. God is saying, put attention over here. Exactly right. Put your ear to the to the, the word. And that doesn't mean just reading the Bible. It means do the Jewish stuff and listen to it. And you'll get the same exact kind of information that you do from the Holy Spirit just talking to you. Only more. A lot more. Because that's how the Holy Spirit talks. You may not like that, but that's how the Holy Spirit talks. She talks to us through the Jewish stuff. The Holy Spirit talks to us through the Jewish stuff. You don't have to do Jewish stuff. But you won't hear her as good because you're not in classes often. It's just that simple. The more you go to class, the more you're going to hear the teacher. The less you go to class, the less you hear the teacher. The less information you get. So there's the, the this is a scroll that is put inside the, this is a case. 
And all mesozoic nowadays have a shin on them, which stands for Shomer Denatot Yisrael, which means keeper of the doors of Israel, but it also stands for Shaddai, Shem Dalit Yod, Shomer Delatot Yisrael. Shin Dalit Yo Shaddai, which is an acronym for Keeper of the Doors of Israel. They all have a shin on them now. Have for, for centuries. Why? Because you're putting God's name on your house. You're putting God's name on your house. So if we look at these, there's only three, but if we look at these passages that say what's on the mezuzah, there's only three in the whole Bible. Uh, Exodus 12, Deuteronomy 6, and Deuteronomy 11. We just read Deuteronomy, no we didn't. Let's go to that. Deuteronomy 6, the, uh, the Shema, which is put in the scroll. <coughs> we should know it by heart. I do know it by heart. It says, and you shall bind these, these words on your forehead and as a sign upon your hand, and you shall write them upon the doorposts, the mezuzot, of your house. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house. That's in Deuteronomy 6, 9. Deuteronomy 11, 20 restates it. Same exact thing. You shall write the word of God on the what? On the what? On the mezuzot, on the doorpost. And the only other passage in the whole Bible that has something put on the doorpost is Exodus 12 at the Passover. What's put on the doorpost? Blood. blood. Therefore, blood equals blood. God's word. Wow. They, they speak the same. They talk the same. They are the same. The blood of the animals is the word of God. The word of God is the blood of God, so to speak, metaphorically. They're the same metaphor. They're the same thing. That's all that ever goes on a doorpost is Torah and blood. Therefore, blood equals Torah. Does that make sense? Yes. So you put your ear to it, and I guarantee you, I guarantee you, because I've done it and I can say from experience, when you look at that blood, when you look at an animal slaughtered properly and you look at that blood, if you don't think it says the same things as Torah, you're out of your mind. It absolutely does. It talks about Yeshua. It talks to you about atonement. It talks to you about your sin. It talks to you about the kingdom. It talks to you about, about certain specific blessings. It talks to you about the word of God. It talks about all kinds of stuff. Not just, you are a sinner in need of a savior. It does not say that. It says all kinds of details. Because I've done it. I know. When you go in a house, and when you come out of a house, you go like this. You kiss it. Or you get it and you kiss it. Either way. When you go in, when you come out. Because in Psalm 2 it says, Kiss the sun, S-O-N. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the dead of in the way. Kiss the sun. Therefore, what's the oh, come on. Therefore, what is the mezuzah? Son. It's the son of God. What do you think of that, pal? And it's the blood. See how all the pictures talk the same? It always comes back around to the same message. Yeshua is the Word of God in the flesh. Yeshua is the blood. They're all the same. And He's the Torah. He's the Torah in flesh. Right. When they did the blood on the doorpost, it was talking, prophesying about Yeshua, His death. Now, we're not going to read all these, but I'm going to tell you what, what they say. Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 3, 4, 6. These all are Shaul, Paul, saying, I am a bondservant. I am a bondservant. Who says? 
What gives him the right to say that? I'm a bond servant? Do you ever think about that? I mean, people quote that all the time. Paul, the bond servant of the Messiah, you should believe say that. Paul, the bond servant of Christ Jesus, etc. I say that. Who says? Who says he's a bond servant? Him? He got up one day and said, I am a bond servant. You can't do that. You can't do that. Galatians 1, Philippians 1, Titus 1, Jacob 1, 2 Peter 1, and Judah 1 all say the same thing. I, or you, are a bond servant. A couple times, uh, Shaul says it of a couple other people. These guys say it about themselves. By the way, Jacob is what they, who they call James. Jacob says it of himself. Judah is who they call Jude. And he says it of himself. Who, what gives them the right to say they're a bond servant of Messiah? I mean, is there, some, is there some law that you follow, some ritual that you go through to become a bond servant of Messiah? What gives them the right to say that? That's metaphorical. I'm talking physical. Like if you met Shaul and he said to you, well, you know, I'm a bondservant of Messiah, you go, why? Are you speaking metaphorically? What do you do for a living? Well, what they're doing is they're quoting this, quote, law. They're quoting this law. They had an understanding of Deuteronomy and Exodus that said that in order to become a bond servant, how long? Forever. Forever. You put your ear on the mezuzah and you pierce it, and I suppose you stick a gold earring in there as a picture of what you're doing, which is listening, and you become a bond servant forever. That's right. That's right. A gold earring goes in the ear after they pierce the ear. And it's a picture of what they're doing, which is listening. Yes? Do we know if it was the left ear or the right ear? It doesn't matter. Or was it, both? It, it very much matters. It's the right ear. Right ear. The right toe, the right ear, and the right hand were anointed by blood and oil on the priests. When they were anointed, when they became priests, God said, put blood on the right toe of the, of the big toe of the right foot, on the ear, right ear, and on the hand. And, it, and it's a picture of the very same thing. So Israel, then, if they wanted to be a bond, bond servant, just like the priests were, forever, they would do the same picture, only without the oil. And what was the significance of the toe? What do you do with your foot? Walk. Walk. What do you do with your hand? Work. What do you do with your ear? Yes. Listen, that's fine. That's as simple as it is. It's, it's saying your walk, your work, your what you listen to is all given to God. How long? Forever. Forever. That's what it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. So these guys, these guys were, were quoting that, I hate to say law or commandment, but for lack of a better term, they were quoting that, that mishpat, that judgment about serving, about serving for six years, and then in the seventh year you go free. But if you want to go free, and you say, I want to serve forever. Why? Because I love you, my master. I love my house. I love my wife. And I want to stay here. And you serve forever. That's what these guys are saying. That's what a, quote, bond servant of Messiah is. It's a slave who wants to stay in the house of Judaism. That's the house. That's the house. It's not, quote, Christianity. Right. The house is Judaism. It's a Jewish house. Because that mishpat was given to Israel. And it took place in Israel. It was acted out in Israel, in Jewish homes. Jewish estates, Jewish plantations, we'll call them. Jewish fields, Jewish farms. And so, nowadays, just like these guys, we're supposed to, if you want to, become a bondservant in a Jewish house 24-7. 
to a Jewish Messiah. Which is a whole lot different from saying, I'm a bomb servant of Christ. Stop. Two totally different things. Right. It's true. This one in Revelation. It says basically the same thing, but I want to look at the one in, in Revelation 19. Um, verse 1 says, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because His judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great whore who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. Who is he talking about? Who were the bond servants that got avenged? Christians during the birth, birth during the tribulation? No. All the Jews who served in the Jewish house for four thousand years. All the Jews of Israel who served and the Gentiles who joined them who served God for 4,000 years. And then finally, the day of the Lord comes, and God avenges those people who went, you know what, I'm going to serve you forever. Go ahead and pierce me. I'm going to put my ear to the meat's foe, and I'm, I'm done, man. I'm done. You got me for the rest of my life. I'm not going anywhere. Those guys are the ones who are going to be avenged. So we're supposed to serve, but here's what's being missed. It's not under compulsion. You shall obey the Lord your God and do His commandments. That's compulsion. That's not God. That's us. That's humans saying, you know, we really want to get everybody in line. We want to make sure our, our church is huge and everybody ministers to one another and all the needs are met. That has nothing to do with the Bible. Nothing. We're not supposed to serve under compulsion. We're supposed to make the choice because we love our house, we love our master, we love our wife, we love our family, and we ain't going anywhere. And I like it. I'm going to stay here in this Jewish house. That is a bond servant of God. That's a bond servant of God. Not obey. Not obey, yes. If I forget Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its strength. Yeah, because it's like, you know, mm -hmm. you've forgotten why you chose to be a monster. Right. You've forgotten why you want to be a monster in the first place. Because you've forgotten Jerusalem. Which, which, by the way, when it says Jerusalem, it doesn't mean Jerusalem. It means yes. the city inside you where you worship God. Which is Judaism. Zion is Judaism. It's like a code word in the Bible. Let's go to uh, Psalm 119. I'm going to finish up. Psalm 119. I can't tell you how many pastors in my life have told me, Michael, don't say the word Judaism. I can't tell you how, messianic, how many Messianic rabbis have said to me, Michael, don't say the word Judaism. Right. Messianic rabbis told me that. Many. I've been, I've been teaching this for 30 years. Now, just now, after 30 years, people are starting to go, uh, maybe that's not stupid. Maybe that's not so stupid. Maybe. Maybe. Psalm 119, under Mem, I don't know what verse it is. This goes according to the Hebrew alphabet. 97. 97, you're close. 97. It says, Ma'ahavati Torah Techa, Kol Hayom Hasichati. Hisichati. Thank you. Kol Hayom Hisichati. Oh, how I love your Torah. Your law. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, how I love your law. Ugh. What a horrible verse. 
Oh, I love your law. Look, <laughs> guy's insane. David's insane. Oh, how I love your your commandments that I must obey. That's nuts. Or it means something else. Ma ahabtiti, ma ahabtiti Torah techa. Oh, how I love your instruction. Why? Because he listens to it and it teaches him. It is my meditation all day long. What's my meditation all day long? Torah. The law, the instruction, right. Judaism. I think about it, I contemplate, I meditate, I roll it over in my mouth and think about it like a gumball, suck the juice off of it all day long. I love it. And then look how them ends. Verse 104. From your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate. It's kind of weird. He's schizophrenic. Oh, how I love. Therefore I hate. He's schizophrenic. If you love the Torah, and by the way, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not. Because we've been taught, we've been sold a bill of goods on our life, that it's bad, Torah bad. So it's hard to do. But if you can get to where you begin to love the Torah, you will hate everything else. Yep. Once you've tasted Torah, really? <laughs> everything else is nonsense. It's just nonsense. And you'll hate it. You'll grow to hate it. It takes time, but you'll get there. Um, I guess I should tell this story. When I was asked one time in my entire life to be on TV, to teach the Bible on TV, one time in my entire life, it was in the big radio st uh, TV station in Midland, I went there and I, I had my pictures book, I had just got it in a you know, decent form, not the big one, not the pictures in the story book, the little one, the first chapter, and I got it into a good form and I was happy with it, they got invited, I got invited there to teach, you know, talk about it and teach on TV. So I'm on TV and I'm trying to be all camera friendly, right? And I, and I got this book. Here's my book picture. So you'll enjoy it. And I go like this. You know what? What's so amazing is that I've learned, you know, and it has it in the book that I love Messiah, but I hate Christ. And I said this on a Christian TV station. And I'm thinking, oh, they're going to like that. I'm thinking this. That's how warped I was. Oh, well, they're going to like that. They're, they're tracking with me. They're going to like it. I was. I became a persona non grata. Immediately. You can understand why. Because I'm an idiot. That's why. I shouldn't have done that. I should have made it somehow palatable. But it's true. It's true. The more I love Yeshua the Messiah and see what he was really like, I hate that guy that everybody thinks of him as. That effeminate, homosexual, long-haired, blonde, Nordic. Man, he's just so gentle. He's, he would never hurt anyone's heart. I hate that guy. He's nothing like my Yeshua. Nothing. In fact, he's exactly the opposite. Potentially. And it takes a long time. I know. I know it takes a long time to, to understand that. I'm not... I'm not talking to you like you understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to talk to you like you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm trying anyway. It takes a long time to get there from, oh, I love your Torah, to I hate every false way. That takes a long time. But that's what we're shooting for. And that's what Judaism will do for you. If, and it's a big if, if you listen to it, you've got to do it first. You've got to do it. Don't just read about it on the internet, please. That's not doing Judaism. That's Hebrew roots. That's what Hebrew roots is. It's an internet project that isn't working very well. That's what Hebrew roots is. It's a blog. It's a blog, right. It's not what God is doing. What God is doing is turning people to do Judaism. And then listen to it and change. Let's pray. Abba, thank you that you gave us two really amazing Torah portions in a row. I give. I give. 
echoes. And, and I thank you, Abba, that you say, in both of them, you start out, if you listen to the meat spoke, if you listen to the meat spoke, you'll receive a blessing. I thank you for that blessing, Abba. I thank you for that blessing, Lord, that we get to know you. Nothing else matters. But Abba, I ask that you continue to pour out your ruach on your body so they, they can get that blessing. So more and more believers can get that blessing from Judaism. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay.